The Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. God of all nations, Lord of all people, thank you for this land that has received your blessings. Lord, throughout our nation's history, you have saved us from calamities. You have blessed us even when we have failed to live up to our great heritage of freedom. Today, empower our senators to protect and guard the foundations of our liberty. Remind them that eternal vigilance continues to be the price we must pay for freedom. When our lawmakers are weary, replenish them with the inspiration of your presence as they remember your promise never to forsake them. Bellow the flickering embers of their hearts until their lives are aglow with the fires of patriotism vision, and hope. We pray in your marvelous name. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., October 20, 2021, to the Senate. Under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Angus S. King, Jr., a senator from the state of Maine, to perform the duties of the chair. Signed, Patrick J. Leahy, President Pro Tempore. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved.
Mr. President. The Majority Leader. I understand that there are six bills at the desk due for a second reading on block. The clerk will read the titles of the bills for the second time. S3005, a bill establishing appropriate thresholds for certain budget points of order in the Senate and for other purposes. S3006, a bill to amend the balanced budget and emergency deficit control act of 1985 and so forth. S3007, a bill to amend the balanced budget and emergency deficit control act of 1985 to extend the discretionary spending limits. S3008, a bill to establish the Federal Rainy Day Fund to control emergency spending. S3009, a bill to amend Title VI of the Social Security Act to remove the prohibition on states and territories against lowering their taxes. S3010, a bill to cap non-interest federal spending as a percentage potential GDP to right-size the government and so forth. In order to place the bills on the calendar under the provisions of Rule 14, I would object to further proceeding on block. Objection having been heard, the bills will be placed on the calendar. Thank you, Mr. President. Now, Mr. President, for over 240 years, the story of American democracy has been an inexorable march towards universal suffrage towards the realization of that sacred principle that all citizens should have a voice in selecting their leaders. The grand ideal had humble beginnings. At the time of the Constitution's ratification, hardly one in 10 Americans would have been even eligible to vote. If you were not white, not a landowner, not a male, and not a Protestant, chances were that the democracy did not apply to you chances were that you were cut out of the political process. It took over two centuries of Americans marching, fighting, and dying for the promise of freedom to expand to our citizens, regardless of race or gender or creed, the right to vote. But for every two steps forward, sometimes there are those who try to pull us one step back. Unfortunately, we find ourselves today in the midst of such a struggle. Across the country, the big lie, the big lie has spread like a cancer as many states across the nation have passed the most draconian restrictions against voting that we've seen in decades. If nothing is done, <clears throat> these laws will make it harder for millions of Americans to participate in their government. If there's anything worthy of the Senate's attention, if there's any issue that merits debate on this floor, it's protecting our democracy from the forces that are trying to unravel it from the inside out. That's why this afternoon, the United States Senate will vote to begin debate on the Freedom to Vote Act. The Freedom to Vote Act is a balanced, effective, and common sense proposal that will fortify our democracy and protect Americans' right to vote. It sets basic standards for all Americans to vote safely and securely, no matter what zip code they live in. It adopts proven reforms that will protect voters from both parties whether they live in blue states or red states or purple states. It fights back against the power of dark money in politics and ends the toxic practice of partisan gerrymandering. <clears throat> and all the while, it respects the rightful authority of states to carry out their elections. At its core, the Freedom to Vote Act rests on a simple principle. Americans must be able to freely choose their leaders, and those leaders must be accountable to the people not to well-heeled donors. These are policies all Americans can get behind. When was the last time we heard Americans cheer about dark money in our elections or the pervasiveness of partisan gerrymandering? What sort of voter would willingly choose to make voting harder, arbitrarily harder, when it should be easy, safe, and secure? <coughs> the Freedom to Vote Act would provide long overdue remedies for all these concerns. Now, crafting this bill, as you know, Mr. President, was no easy feat. It took months of hard work, compromise, and gathering feedback from experts on sensible policies that have been proven to work. I want to thank all of my colleagues who dedicated their energies to making this moment possible. And I want to especially thank Senator Manchin for his hard work over the past few weeks. 
He's reached across the aisle to try and find a way for the Senate to do its work in a bipartisan fashion. I thank him for his commitment to finding bipartisanship on a subject that by all accounts should be bipartisan to its core and has been for much of our history. Now today's vote is a cloture vote simply on a motion to proceed. It presents senators with a simple question. Should the Senate even debate, debate voting rights? That's what this is about, simply a debate and an important one to be sure. No Republican is being asked to sign their name to this or that policy today, but they are being asked to come to the table and have a discussion and allow amendment. I want to be clear. If Republicans join us in proceeding to this bill, I'm prepared to hold a full-fledged debate worthy of the U.S. Senate. The minority will have the chance to have their voices heard. The Senate has already voted on more amendments than in any year under former President Trump. And on this legislation, again, Republican senators would be able to offer amendments. But for that to happen, we have to get on the bill today. What we can't accept is a situation where one side is calling for bipartisan debate and bipartisan cooperation, while the other refuses to even engage in a dialogue. If our Republican colleagues don't like our ideas, they have a responsibility to present their own. It's ludicrous for any Republican to assert that the federal government has no role to play in safeguarding elections when state laws disenfranchise American citizens. I invite them to read the Constitution of the United States of America, which precisely empowers Congress to regulate, quote, the times, places, and manners of holding elections, unquote. I invite them to look at modern American history, when the Senate stepped into the breach numerous times when Jim Crow states sought to restrict the right to vote. There's a long and hallowed tradition of the Senate, often in a bipartisan coalition, working to protect access to the franchise. And today, our colleagues should vote to begin debate for how we can add to that legacy. But, we're, what, we're, but what Republicans should not do, they must not do, is squelch any chance, any chance, for the Senate to debate something as critical, as sacrosanct, as American as the right to vote. <clears throat> the clock is ticking on our chance to take meaningful action. Our experiment in democracy has been the greatest feat of self-rule in all of modern history. We cannot allow it to black backslide here in the 21st century. Today we have a chance to begin debate on how we can prevent that from happening, but Republicans must join us in the debate and vote to allow vote debate to proceed. I urge my colleagues to vote yes. Now on a another matter, Mr. President, BBB, Build Back Better. Even as we work to push legislation in defense of our democracy, Senate Democrats are also making good progress on reaching an agreement on President Biden's Build Back Better plan. Yesterday, Senate Democrats had a very spirited and very positive caucus lunch to go over the latest outstanding items before we can all reach a deal. We walked out of that lunch united in our desire to reach an agreement this week. I believe we can get it done, and I want to thank all my colleagues for their leadership, diligence, and focus on reaching an end result. We're going to keep talking to each other all week long until we get the job done. Later this morning, I'll speak again with the Speaker and with the White House to go over the latest details of the President's proposal. I've spoken to the President just about every day and Speaker Pelosi several times a day about these issues. I'll continue meeting with my caucus to try and keep us all on the same page, because be on the same page we must. Everyone is going to have to compromise if we're going to find that legislative sweet spot we can all get behind. Nobody will get everything they want, but no matter what, our final proposal will deliver the core promise we made to the American people. We will take bold action against the climate crisis while creating millions of new, good-paying jobs. We will expand economic opportunity and lower costs for working Americans. And we will cut taxes for working and middle-class Americans while asking the wealthy to pay their fair share. In short, we will deliver on a bill that dramatically improves the lives of millions and millions and millions of American families. We're getting closer to an agreement. 
We want to finalize a deal by the end of this week, but we all must keep moving together. And finally, on nominations. Mr. President, yesterday I was proud to announce my recommendation of a great New Yorker and a great friend to serve as the next U.S. Ambassador to Jamaica, Nick Perry, of my hometown of Brooklyn. I cannot think of a better person to represent Jamaica, to represent our country in Jamaica than Assemblyman Perry. If confirmed, he would be the first ever Jamaican-born American to hold that post. I always ask folks in, when I'm in Brooklyn, what's the biggest island in the Caribbean? I tell them it's a trick question. They guess. Well, maybe it's Haiti, maybe it's Barbados, maybe it's Cuba. I say, no, it's Brooklyn, which has more Caribbean immigrants than anywhere else. So Nick Perry's nomination is great news for our community and our country. For decades, Assemblyman Perry has served Brooklyn by doing things the old-fashioned way, working hard, never resting on his laurels, and earning the trust of the people he represents. He's a true American success story, an immigrant, a veteran of the Army, a graduate of Brooklyn College. I know he'll do excellent work of our, as our next ambassador. <clears throat> from Pat Patrick Ewing to KRS-One, from Vice President Kamala Harris to Congresswoman Yvette Clark to the late General Powell, Jamaican Americans hold a key place in our nation's rich legacy. Nick Perry will continue adding to this legacy as he has for decades, and I'm proud to support him as nominee for ambassador. And finally today, the Senate will also move forward on Catherine Lamon to be Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights at the Department of Education. All her career, Ms. Lamon has been an unshakable champion for civil rights and for all students who want a fair shake in their education. This would be the second time she serves as Assistant Secretary. So she has the experience, the leadership, and the dedication to stand up for students from all walks of life, something sorely lacking under the previous administration. I look forward to confirming her nomination. I yield the floor. Note the absence of a quorum. We'll call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. President. The Republican leader. I ask consent that further proceedings on the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. The federal government's own analysis of the energy sector are predicting 
that this winter, American families could face home heating bills that are 54% higher than last year, 54% higher than just last year. On average, the price for households running on natural gas is expected to jump 30%. For homes that use propane, a different assessment says the forecast looks like, quote, propane market Armageddon. As the head of one aid organization put it, quote, after the beating that people have taken in the pandemic, it's like, what's next? What's next? Well, astonishingly, what's next is yet another reckless taxing and spending spree from Washington Democrats, including more inflationary spending to push costs even higher, and more anti-domestic energy taxes and regulations that would only compound these problems. That includes new crushing taxes aimed at domestic natural gas production. They want to reprise the Obama administration's war on coal, but this time the target is also, in addition to coal, the target is also the natural gas that provides electricity for our communities and heats families' homes. And then there are the new mandates and new penalties that are essentially designed to make 49 states' electrical grids move more in the direction of California's, paying higher costs for less reliable power. Now, unfortunately, <clears throat> this has been the Biden administration's playbook going back to the very beginning. Remember, killing the Keystone XL pipeline and thousands of American jobs was a day one, a day one priority. Then there was the ban on new development of domestic energy reserves and the hasty mission to rejoin the toothless Paris Climate Accords where virtually nobody, nobody but America seems to be remotely interested in achieving their non-binding, quote, commitments, end quote. So for all the left wing's apparent urgency to pass radical climate policy, they seem not to care much about tackling the biggest sources of the world's carbon emissions. The so-called international community that had scrapped together, scraped together the, the failed Paris deal could only get the world's most prolific polluter, that is China, to agree, now listen to this, to agree to curb its increase in emissions nine years from now. That's all they got out of China, an agreement to curb their emissions nine years from now. That's what this administration calls a good deal. America signs up for self-inflicted pain today, and China maybe, maybe thinks about beginning to follow suit in another decade. So listen. China continues to produce more than one-fourth, one-fourth of the world's carbon output, roughly two and a half times as much as the United States. Instead of fighting back against our adversaries, Democrats' reckless taxing and spending spree would just hand deliver them one big gift right after another. <clears throat> like the big new tax hikes on American businesses that would leave our industries paying higher tax rates than businesses in communist China. Like doubling down on the anti-energy policies that already had the Biden administration going hat in hand to Russia and OPEC and begging them to up their own production for us. As our colleague Senator Barrasso pointed out yesterday, before the Biden administration took over, America was enjoying energy independence for the first time in seven decades. Before the Biden administration took over, America was enjoying energy independence for the first time in seven decades. But now we're heading the other way. America has doubled our oil purchases from Russia on President Biden's watch. We're twice as dependent on Russian oil today as we were before this administration 
took power. And President Biden green-lighted Putin's new gas pipeline that will give Moscow even more leverage over the European continent. So Democrats want our nation on a path toward less energy independence and higher costs for working families. Their reckless taxing and spending spree would make it all dramatically worse. <clears throat> now, in another matter, our country would be much better off if our Democratic colleagues shelved their radical wish list and focused on their fundamental responsibilities as a one-party government. But while they continue to spin their wheels negotiating this reckless taxing and spending spree, their most basic jobs are being neglected. This week, already months behind the usual pace, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee released partisan drafts of spending bills that are dead on arrival. They spend too much. They cut our longstanding taxpayer protections like the Hyde Amendment. And they shortchange our national defense, even as we face serious and growing threats from terrorism and from major competitors like China and Russia. Most of these bills can't earn 50 votes, much less 60. When Republicans ran the Senate by this time of year, we had bipartisan frameworks in hand for months, and we were hammering out the fine details across the aisle. Our Democratic colleagues are way, way behind schedule with no solution in sight. It's also looking increasingly likely that we'll reach Veterans Day before the Senate takes up the National Defense Authorization Act. Now, never mind that this year's bill earned overwhelming bipartisan support in committee. Never mind that it represents this body's single most important opportunity to influence national security. Our troops are being put in the back seat so the socialists can drive the car. And at the end of the month, because House liberals still cannot get their act together and pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which the Senate passed months ago, major highway projects and American workers are scheduled to be thrown into limbo. Our Democratic colleagues have unified control of the government. Unified control of the government. The country needs them to start, stop arguing among themselves over how to waste trillions of dollars and get about executing their most basic jobs. Now, one final matter. Later today, the Democratic leader will have the Senate vote on the latest iteration of his party's election takeover scheme. Frankly, I've just about lost count of how many times our Democratic colleagues have tried to truss up the same takeover with new trappings. For multiple years running, Washington Democrats have offered a rotating merry-go-round of rationales to explain why they need to federalize voting laws and take over all of American elections themselves. But every time they try this stick in the Senate, it falls flat. Today will be no exception. The latest umpteenth iteration is only a compromise in the sense that the left and the far left argued among themselves about exactly how much power to grab and in which areas. This latest bill still subjects popular common sense election integrity protections like voter ID to the whims of federal bureaucrats. It still sends government money to political campaigns. Government money, taxpayers' money to political campaigns. For goodness sake, it still puts Washington in the middle of states' redistricting decisions, and on and on. The same rotten core is all still there. The Senate knows how to make a law in a productive bipartisan way. We've done it this year on multiple subjects. We've done it on election issues themselves in recent memory. The Help America Vote Act, 20 years ago that Chris Dodd and I put together. We did that when there was an actual problem that needed solving and an actual bipartisan process. But as long as Senate Democrats remain fixated on their radical agenda, 
This body will continue to do the job the framers assigned it and stop terrible ideas in their tracks. Morning business is closed. Under the previous order, the Senate will proceed to executive session and resume consideration of the following nomination, which the clerk will report. Nomination, Department of Education, Catherine Elizabeth Lehman of California to be Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights. Clerk, call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. 